there is this. Well, it's a. It's it's like a statistic. It's a number uh, that can be calculated. It's called the expected value. And this is like blah, 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 life insurance, I don't care. I want a post, it can be about life insurance, but it must address expected value. And I have a great example here. Let's go through it. If I start off with a probability table, then I can calculate an expected value. This is not quite right still. Let me fix it. We start off with a probability table. It has events, it has probabilities. But with each one of these events, there's a corresponding monetary event. And what I posit here is a fictitious skydiver insurance policy. So if you go, so like you're going to sign up for skydiving, and then before they get on the plane, they scare you, and say, well, you know, uh, one in a hundred thousand skydivers crash into the ground or whatever. But you can get a million dollar life insurance policy right now that covers this trip for just fifty bucks. Pay fifty dollars right now. That's your premium. And if something goes wrong, the benefit is a, a million. You understand the setup? Okay. Um, this is a term life policy because it's only valid for just this one skydive. And we are going to calculate the expected value from the perspective of the insurance company. It's like we're the ones selling the insurance. And it would be nice to know if our scheme here is profitable. Right? Like we did our research and we found that, you know, it's, it's one in a hundred thousand skydivers will not return safe. <laughs> what a euphemism for dies. 
uh, and we can make this probability table. There's just the two events because they are complementary events, right? You will either return safe or not return safe, and there's not a third option. That makes the table easy to create. Now, we're creating this table from the perspective of the insurance company, like we're the owners. So if the person returns safe, if the Scott ever returns safe, then we're keeping their $50. But if they don't return safe, then we're going to have to pay out a million. But they still paid that 50, so it's right here. And then these are the probabilities. You can see that they add up to one. This is all of the, this is a probability table. Now back when, uh, uh, I think not the last homework assignment, but the one before it in week three. At the end of at the end of the week three homework, they gave you probability tables, and you had numbers here, and you had probabilities here, right? And they ended up asking you for the mean of the probability table, and they asked you for the standard deviation. Of that problem. And you, you found it by going to uh, StatCrunch and using the normal, or excuse me, using the custom calculator. All right? <clears throat> but that, that mean, that mean of that probability table is, is actually pretty easy to find. And it is the expected value. Expected values usually written like this, E of X, where this is this capital X. It's called a random event. Randomly, I mean, I might, I might run this business for, you know, we might do a million jumps and nobody dies. Or somebody could die on the very first one. Uh, it's a random occurrence. One of these things will happen and, and we call these events you know, this is like my variable, and either one of these could be the possibilities for x and then the expected value of those events. Okay, so that average is the expected value. It's calculated super easy. It's a weighted mean. It's a weighted mean, just like your GPA is a weighted mean. It's this number times this number plus this number times this number. Look, you can see it here. We have the, the monetary event times its probability. So that $50 gets weighted by that probability. And then this amount that I have to pay out gets weighted by that probability. I need to rerun that computation because I don't think it's 40. Let's see. So uh, we'll have $50 uh, times, uh, you know, 999,950 times this thing. Oh, it is 40. Okay, great. I don't have to change anything. I do this computation. It, 
it tells me that the expected value is 40. That's the number I get. And our interpretation, it's a positive 40. So then my interpretation is that on the average, every time I sell one of these policies, I can expect to profit by $40. <coughs> now, um, that's with the expectation that after I sell about, you know, in, in the course of selling 100,000 of these things, there's probably going to be one payout, maybe. Probably doesn't have to, but it could. There could be more. I could I, I could go bankrupt because I could have, I could I could I could have the the plane crash on the first trip, and kill everybody. Or we might operate the business for thirty years and never have a problem. But. This is, given those probabilities, this is what I can expect to earn on each policy sold. Well, what would you say then is the situation for the person purchasing the policy? What would their expected value be? The only thing that would have to change is that they're paying $50 or they're paying $50 and collecting a million. So their expected value would just be minus 40, which would say that on the average, if they did this, if they went on a hundred thousand skydives, they'd, <laughs> you know, they can expect to lose $40 each time they buy the policy. They won't lose the whole 50 because there is some probability here that they could collect on that policy and that uh, adjusts this, you know, they're not just paying it, they're paying out 50 every time but, but because they will could potentially collect that million the, 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 the reality of average payout is just $40. Let's look at a much simpler example than that one. One of my favorites. I made it up a long time ago. We're going to play a game. It's a dice game. Very easy rules. Roll a six, just one die. Roll a six, and you win six dollars. Else, you lose. Cost to play, I'm not gonna let you pay, play for free, right? Cost to play is one dollar. You understand the game? Great. Let's compute the expected value of this game. I want to know, is this game profitable for the person hosting it? Is it advantageous for the person playing it? Who's going to make money in this game? Well, you're going to either win or lose, right? How do you win? You roll a six. What's the probability of rolling a six on a regular die? One, six. One out of six. So then what's the probability that you would lose? Five out of six. Five out of six. This does add up to one. It's a probability table. What was the money associated with winning? You win six dollars. But didn't it cost to play? So you had to pay a dollar to get in the game. But if you lose, then they just keep your dollar. 
All right. This is the table. The computation would be the 6 minus 1, which is 5, times the probability that you win, plus the negative 1 times the probability that you lose. And you can plainly see what this would add up to. And what does it add up to? Resist the temptation. Mm -hmm. What is this number? Five times. Which is the fraction five six. <laughs> now look at it again. This is five six. Five six minus five six is what it says. And you get zero. The expected value is zero for this game. It's called fair. You could play this all day long. You could sit there and play this game all day long and when you are bored and quit, you can expect that no one has made any headway. Right? The, the person operating the game has not profited. The person playing the game has not profited. So that's a very easy example. <clears throat> Let's do another one. Here is, here is a type of example that you could absolutely do. I would suggest doing something similar to what I'm about to do here for your discussion board. Uh, a warranty. You know, like the warranties that you buy at the store when they're, just, they're trying to, you know, you buy a microwave or whatever and then they want to sell you this warranty. A warranty at the checkout. All right. Let's just make up something that sounds reasonable. Uh, microwave sounds good. I'm going to buy a microwave. How much do microwaves cost? No, no, no. I have a fancy house. $300. $300. I want something that's worth getting a warranty on, right? This is a this is a this is a stainless steel microwave that goes over the stove or something. And I've paid $300 for it. And forget about the tax and all that. That's just it's 300 bucks. What would you say is a reasonable price for a warranty? Maybe it lasts, um, I don't know, 10 years, five years. How much would you pay? Ten year warranty? And, and the way it'll work is that, is that they'll verify, you know, it'll, get, it'll break and you'll say, here, I need a new one, and they'll give you a new one, right? Uh, Ten-year, and what's the price? How much are we paying for this warranty? Thirty dollars. Thirty dollars. What would you say is the probability, you know, pr pretend like you have done some research, but then just guess. What's the probability, you think, of this microwave breaking down in 10 years? Huh? Slim? 
I need a number. That's a guaranteed. Point zero one. Ten percent chance. Oh, a one percent chance. Yeah. Okay. A one percent chance of failure. Here's our table. Uh, it will either break or it will not break. Those are my events. Now, for the money, in either one of these cases, I'm buying the warranty. So there's a minus 30 in either of them. But if it breaks, I'm going to get a new microwave, a new $300 microwave. So the money associated with the thing breaking is 270, but if it doesn't break, then I'm just out my 30 bucks. And the corresponding probabilities, we decided that the probability it would break is 0 0.01, so for, to not break, it'd be 0 0.99. That makes it a probability table. Because these are complementary events, then this probability must just be 1 minus 0.01, so you get 0.99. All right, what is the expected value? I'm going to calculate it up here, and we're going to see if we got the same answer. You would take 270 times 0.01. Oh, I mix those two up. What's the number? Negative 27. Interpret it for me. Is this warranty profitable for the people selling it? Yes. They're making $27 every time they sell this warranty. On the average. Right? They're collecting 30. Sometimes they got to replace a microwave though. But according to those probabilities, this is their profit that they can expect to earn on each one of them. If you, the customer though, you know, maybe you own like an apartment complex and you're buying boatloads of microwaves. Uh, and if you got the warranty on all of them, you can expect to lose $27 on average every time you bought it. So it's not something profitable for you to do. Uh, it's just, you know, an option. The, the people selling it are making money, and on the average, you will lose money. Um, but that's 
That's how insurance works. <clears throat> insurance would not be able to afford to pay us on a claim if they weren't profitable. So I'm going to do one more example, and this will be about a raffle. And we'll, we'll keep it simple. There's a raffle. You can buy tickets. Uh, we don't know the price of these tickets. We want to set the price for these tickets in such a way that our raffle, um, uh, you know, like it, it's, a, it's a fundraiser, I guess. You know, I'm trying to raise funds. I'm trying to raise $1,000 for whatever, Girl Scout troop. And our goal is to raise, let's just say, $1,000. And um, <coughs> I'm going to sell, uh, we're going to sell 200 tickets. And the prize, what should the prize be? I don't know. What do people want nowadays? Like a vacation? Do they just want cash? Let's give them a vacation. A vacation. How much is this vacation worth? Four grand? All right, so we're going to sell 200 tickets, and we're going to suppose that we could sell all of them. The prize, we don't know what price to put the tickets at yet, but we need to be able to profit $1,000 and pay for this prize. Okay, so... Uh, no problem. There's going to be two events. You either win or you don't. The probability of winning, there's just going to be the one winning ticket, right? So it's one out of 200. So that means there's 199 losers. Now we just need to correctly write down the monetary statement uh, to make this um, work out for us. So, uh, if you win, then you got a $4,000 vacation, but you paid the price of the ticket. We'll just call it P. If you lose, then you're just out that ticket price, P. Now we can write down our computation for the expected value, and if our goal is to have raised $1,000, then how much should we be profiting on each ticket? profit on each ticket. Five dollars. See it? We will. Oh. We will, but I want the I, I ultimately want my profit on each ticket to be five dollars. Okay. So my exp so then I'm saying I want my expected value to be five dollars. The computation for that expected value would be 4,000 minus P times 1 over 200 plus a minus P 
times 199 over 200, and it would need to equal 5. Okay. I'm going to distribute that 1 over 200 into the parentheses. Uh, so you'd get 4,000 over 200, that's 40 over 2, right? So, you, so, it's, so we would say 20 minus P over 200 minus uh, 199 P over 200 needs to equal to 5. But these add up to just P, minus P, right? This is minus 1 200th of a P. This is minus 199th 200th of a P. So together, that's minus P. This now says 20 minus P equals 5. It says 20 minus P equals 5. Add P to both sides and subtract 5, what's the ticket price? 15. We should sell the tickets for $15 each. We'll be able to pay for the $4,000 vacation. And when it's all said and done, we'll have $1,000 left in our account. This is expected value. Very handy uh, phenomenon. Yeah. And it's all predicated on us being able to create this probability table. If you can create this table and get some monetary events going with it, then there is an expected value there somewhere. What's up? So if you multiply 15 by 200, you only get 3,000. <clears throat> Okay, hold on, let me see. I see the problem. Whose money is this? Ours. The winners, right? Mm -hmm. They won four thousand. They paid out that. So then, but then this is. But when I wrote this, it was from the perspective of the people running the raffle. This should have said minus five. If this is going to be set up like the person playing the game, then so should this. The expected, val the expected amount to lose on each ticket is a, a minus $5. That's how, much, that's how much, on the average, each person is going to be contributing. That's how much they'll end up losing. Somebody's going to get this vacation, and, and they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna be making uh, 3995 Actually, that's not right. It's, it's, it's this. It's minus P. That the problem is that this just needs to be negative. Go ahead and change this to a minus, and you would see that this would end up being 25, right? Mm -hmm. And then 25 times 200 should be uh, 5,000. Yeah. That's what it is. So uh, let's, in, in order so for it not to be confusing, if we want the expected value to be 5, let's write these monetary events 
like we're the person running the raffle. So the price that we would collect on each ticket, but, but I got to pay out for that vacation. Right? And then, and, and then that table now matches the, the five, the positive five, and everything else will be the same. P minus, so it's the price of the ticket minus the vacation times one over 200 plus the price of the ticket times 199 over 200 equals five. Then P over 200 minus 20 plus 199 P over 200 equals to five, and now P is 25. Okay, so they were $25 tickets. It's a good thing we caught that or else we would have sold all of our tickets and not had enough to pay for the, not only would we have not made our, raised any money, we would have lost money. Cool. Okay, good catch. All right, so on the discussion board, you're going to make up something, make up a scenario, make a table, calculate our expected value. That's what I'm wanting to see. All right, time to get down to business here with uh, confidence intervals. Confidence intervals is um, precisely the point in the course where students start to uh, you know, they start to not like it okay. because it's hard. There's gnashing of teeth. There's uh, there's cries for help. There's um, mass confusion. But I will take it slow. I will explain it in a very organized manner. And you will successfully compute uh, the solutions to these questions. <coughs> First, we need some backstory. The confidence interval tries to estimate for you the value of a parameter. A parameter is a statistic, but it's about the population. So we're trying to make estimates about some number that describes the population, like the mean, or the population proportion. So at first in this assignment, they start us off doing proportions. Um, this symbol, little p, this is the population proportion. Perhaps, uh, you know, what is it, like 12% of the American public has diabetes. That's a, that's a population proportion because it's about the whole American public, right? And they think it's 12%. They don't know because they didn't check everybody. They didn't ask me. How do they, how do they know it's 12%? They have a very strong estimate. They're, they're very confident in their estimate because they can 
collect a bunch of evidence in the form of a sample. They can collect a sample and then check that sample. As long as this sample is demographically very similar to the population, then you can use these techniques. And they'll get what's called a P hat. This thing is a hat. It's called a P hat. Like that's an official math term. <laughs> this is P hat, and it is um, a fraction. It is the number of, and we'll put it in quote, successes. It's the whatever I'm looking for. I mean, I wouldn't say it's successful that you have diabetes, but if I'm trying to count the number of people that have diabetes, I'll call having diabetes a success. And it will be divided by the total number of observations. This is just a probability at the end of the day, right? It's, it's the part over the whole. If I had 1,000 people and 120 of them had diabetes, then it'd be 120 over 1,000. Okay. And we call this number p hat, we call it the point estimate. Point estimate. I don't know why the word point is there. I could have just said estimate, but it's the point estimate. This is the thing I want to make a little interval of numbers, you know, like a, like a, like a lower number and an upper number. And then this, my expectation is that this thing, which I don't know, and no one else knows either, lives inside this interval. that it's between, that it's somewhere bigger than the small number but less than the upper number. And I would like to talk about how confident I am that that P is inside this interval. Okay. So you could imagine that if I'm going to create an interval like, just imagine the real number line, and you have, you know, like, this is the, the bottom, this is the bottom of my interval, and there's the top of my interval. There's a number that's right halfway in the middle, isn't it? Of course there is, right? The number that's halfway here in the middle, actually, if this is my minimum and this is my maximum, we would have called that the mid-range back in week two. And that number that's right in the middle has this fantastic property that the length of the segments on each side are the same, right? Let's call this capital E for error, like a margin of error. And, and it is this point estimate that's right in the middle of our confidence interval. The limits of this confidence interval are often called the lower limit and the upper limit. So it's just, an, it's, it's just a piece of the number line, and then there is some interval that we're going to construct where the point estimate is right smack dab in the middle of this interval. It must be in the middle of this interval because the way I'm going to build it is I'm going to take that point estimate and I'm going to add and subtract this margin of error. This is telling me, this is telling us that the confidence interval is the point estimate plus or minus the margin of error. That's the answer to it. That's the answer to, to all of them. You find the point estimate. You calculate the error term. And if, if, I'm, if I'm starting right here at the point estimate, I'll add E, and I'll get the upper limit. Uh, and to get the lower limit, I would take 
in my point estimate and subtract E. And I would be at the lower limit. So my upper limit must be equal to that point estimate plus the error, and my lower limit is just that point estimate minus the error. And what is happening is that we are asserting that P, not P hat, but P, the population pr uh, proportion is somewhere in this interval. Maybe it's right there. Uh, who knows? It's somewhere in there. I don't, I don't actually know where. All I can say is this is how confident I am that it is in between the lower limit and the upper limit. So quite often the answer is written like we have our we have our lower limit that we've calculated. It is less than P, which is in turn less than the upper limit. Then this string of inequalities says that this number I'm, this number I'm trying to found lives in between the lower limit and the upper limit. This is a confidence interval. Make sense so far? So basically, we have the answers. We have the answer. It's right here. If you get confused somewhere along the way, fall back on the fact here that we already know what the answer is. It's p hat plus or minus the error. You just don't know what the error is yet. Don't worry. It'll come. p hat plus or minus the error. But this thing is not just an interval, it is a confidence interval. There's an associated degree of confidence that we have that P really will be in between the lower limit and the upper limit. Okay. If my interval is very, very small, then there's not much, there's not much wiggle room, right? I would have a corresponding low confidence that P is in there. But if I had a very wide interval, there's a really good chance then that I've got an interval wide enough that P is in there. So this wide interval would correspond to a high degree of confidence. Okay? How do we define this confidence? Look at the normal curve. This is the standard normal curve. Mean of zero, standard deviation of one. We define the confidence level. The confidence level is this area. It's this symmetric area about the center, right? Whatever that area is, that is my confidence level. No problem so far, right? So like if I wanted, if, if my confidence level was, let's say, 95%, then I would open up my stack crunch calculator, I would switch it to between, I'd put in 95%, and it would draw this picture where 95% of the area is right here in between two numbers. You know what I'm saying? And because it's a perfectly symmetric area, then whatever this number is, A, then this would be negative A. Right? This confidence level is just the area centered here in the middle on the normal curve. And the thing that we say it's equal to is this. It's 1 minus alpha. It's not an x. It's a Greek a. It's an alpha. Alpha. Now, this seems to come up out of nowhere, but I promise it's meaningful. 
The confidence level is defined as 1 minus alpha. It is this area between these two numbers, between these two numbers on the z-axis, whatever they are. And those numbers, in turn, have a name. Uh, but first, if this confidence level is going to be defined as 1 minus alpha, then what is the area in each of these tails? Remember that the area under the whole thing has to add up to 1. In this case, for 95%, yes. But I want you to, instead of saying 95%, this is 1 minus alpha. So if it is this quantity, tell me, how did you get 2.5%? What did you do? Uh huh. Yeah. There's five left. How much is, if we had to get to one, and here we're at 1 minus alpha, how much more do we need to get to 1? You said for at 1 and you're minusing alpha, how much do we need to get? How far away is this from 1? That's the question that you asked yourself. You said 95, you said 95%, that's 5% away from 1. How far away is this from 1? It's written right there. Okay, so this is where I'm getting confused. Mm -hmm. So you're saying 1 minus alpha. What is alpha? Like, is some, that... It's some unknown quantity. I don't know it right now. It's somewhere between 0 and 1. It's just a number. Okay. Pretend it's, pretend it's uh, 0.5. Then wouldn't this equal? 95%? Yeah. Okay. And what did I say to pretend it was? 0.5. And 0.5 was how far away you were from? Okay, so how far away from 1 is this? In other words, this plus what equals 1? You can solve that for alpha if you need to. You'll you'll be you'll kick yourself. It's not zero. If I put zero there for the question mark, huh? What should, there's a zero going on here somewhere, but it's not the question mark. One plus zero is one, isn't it? So what's it gonna what would question mark need to be so that this part here was zero? It's like I have a, it's like here's a dollar. I got a dollar in change. Somebody takes some of it away. How much do they need to put back so I have a dollar again? The same amount. The same amount. So the question mark is what? Alpha. Alpha. It's the same amount. Okay. So I understand. I was just thinking, like, since you said alpha is going to be zero, then why can't the question mark be zero? Alpha is not necessarily zero, it's just some number between one and zero. That's what's getting me. Okay. Okay. One minus alpha plus alpha is one. Right. All right. So when you were when when you were thinking of the example that it was ninety-five percent, and then you said, well, there's just five percent left to go, how did you get that it was two and a half percent in each tail? You divided it in half. Yeah. So if we have alpha left to go to get to 1, then what's the area in each tail? 1 minus alpha over divided in half. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. How much is left to go to get to 1? 
alpha. Let's take that and do what? Divide it, divide it. Divide it in two. Half of alpha. Half of alpha is what is in each tail. Alpha over two. Alpha over two. You can sit here and compute it now. One minus alpha plus alpha over two plus alpha over two, sure enough, adds up to one. All of the area is accounted for. Alpha over two is the area that's just in this tail. Then that number that's right there on the z-axis, this dot has the name z sub alpha over two, where it's referencing how much area is to its right. That's, if, you, if I see the Z and then a little subscript, then that little subscript is saying you have that much area to the right. So we can, so whatever number, uh, you know, if, if this was 95%, if this was 95%, that would be 1.96. You can test it in your normal calculator. verify. I can always get my normal calculator going. I go to get more help, stat crunch. I go to stat calculators normal. I'll switch it to between. It puts that area in between. I'll insist that it be 95%. Do you see? There's 95% of the area in between. You have 2.5% in each tail. And the Z sub alpha over 2 is 1.96. Okay? All right. That Z sub alpha over 2 is going to be used in computing our margin of error. Because this would, this would give us the, this would say to us, we want to be 95% confident in our uh, findings. Uh, so I'm going to end up taking a standard deviation and multiplying it by 1.96. It's going to take that standard deviation and stretch it out by this much. And that's going to be my margin of error. What if I was only, what if I was like just, you know, not, not as serious, and it was just, you know, I only want to be 50% sure. I don't need to be very sure. Right? Then now this number is smaller than 1. It's going to take that standard deviation and shrink it down. My margin of error is going to get shrunk down. That's going to give me an interval that's not near as wide doesn't need to be that wide because I don't need to be that confident. What if it's a very serious and dangerous new drug and I need to be extra confident? I need to be 99.99% confident. Then I'm getting a number much bigger than 1.96. So when I go and multiply that standard deviation by this, it's going to get even, it's going to be nearly twice as big as it was when I was just 95% sure. So the bigger this number is right here, the wider and wider my margin of error is going to be. And that will in turn make the, the confidence interval very, 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 very wide. If the confidence interval is very, very wide, then there's a pretty good chance that my number is inside it. There's only one more thing you need to know before I can tell you what the formula for the error is. And that's the standard deviation of the proportion. We, we saw that the mean was called P.
and that p hat was uh, your point estimate is like your sample mean. It's, it's your sample mean is what it really is. So then the sample standard deviation of the proportion is this very unpleasant calculation. The square root of p hat times 1 minus p hat over n. Remind me what's little n? Hmm? Number? Number of what? Sample size. Sample size. Sample size. So if I had, you know, if I got my thousand people that I sampled and, and uh, uh, you know, 11% of them had diabetes, then, then this would be 11% times 89% over 1,000, take a square root. And that's the standard deviation of the proportion. It's just the definition of it. Then our margin of error is defined as z sub alpha over 2 times the standard deviation of the proportion. Note, sometimes, Sometimes people make it more complicated than it needs to be, and they and they say they say that there's this Q. If you see if, if you're doing some of this and you somebody's talking about Q, they mean one minus p. Q is one minus p hat. But there's really no reason to introduce this other thing because I've already got p hat. I can just do this. It's like, this is my point estimate. If that's 12%, then this is 100% minus 12%. You know, it's easy to get. If this was 0.2, then that's 0.8. If this was, if this was 0.35, then that's 0.65. It's like making change for a dollar. Know? It's like this is the price of the thing they're buying, and suppose it costs less than a dollar, and then they give me a dollar, and I have to take away the price of the thing they're buying, so this is like their change. It's like the price and their change. That's how I, that's how I do it anyway. So. Tomato, tomato. Tomato, tomato? Um, yeah, with the Q. I, I used to do it, but I got tired of people saying, what is Q again? So I was like, let me just not use it. And then I don't get asked. <laughs> I don't get asked because, I mean, there's just no reason to, to have it. No real reason I can think of to have it. All it does is make you have a few less symbols over there. But if it, but if it means there's one less thing to remember, I'll write the symbols. This is our margin of error. And we know what the answers to confidence intervals look like. They look like p hat plus or minus e. So let's take a break, and when we come back, we will try one of these problems. We've got all the machinery needed. Hmm? Oh, yeah. It's just a, it's a cheap old calculator. But it has the advantage of, you know, I can I can enter fractions and stuff in a natural way. Right. Okay, because I did find the online uh, this one right here. The online that I can go to function. I can just do it that way. So oh, no. I like this website, but I like it for graphics. Um, it, it is certainly possible to do it with any calculator. Okay. But, yeah, okay. it, is, it is easier here. So at, at a minimum, the calculator should have an answer function. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, so you can go. So you can you can get by if you go to uh, Google mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. type calculator and use the one that they provide like right on the search okay, search the screen. Window, okay. Because it has an answer function, and we we are going to need it because it's okay. it's not fun to try and type the whole thing in all at once with no mistakes. Okay, it's, it's much easier to go step by step. I'll just, I'll start inside the fraction and I'll just do the numerator and then I'll right. and then I'll hit, you know, the number. Then I'll take the square root of that answer. And mm -hmm. then I'll take Z sub alpha over two times that answer. Right. And it's much, much more um, reliable. Okay. But if you did want to get one of these calculators, it's a Casio. Yeah. They're maybe 15 bucks, and uh, it's the only calculator I'll, I use is a, is a Casio because they have that natural display. Okay.
<clears throat> All right. What is what is lowercase n in this question? Samples values. And what number is that? Okay, n is 864, and we'll call a success being a boy. The birth is a boy. So then p hat is 422 over 864. Okay then, well, uh, I can make this little probability table down here. Uh, I would need uh, 300 and something, something, uh, 370. Four, I think. Because four hundred and twenty two plus three hundred and seventy four is not the right number. Uh, it would be three hundred and it would be three hundred and uh, forty two. That's what it is. And then when you add those together, I get I'm off by a hundred four. So four hundred and forty two girls out of eight hundred and sixty four babies. So this is a probability table now. It adds up to one. And I know right away what one minus p hat is. It's this, right? These add up to one. And so one take away this is just that number. One minus p hat is 442 over 864. I've got p hat, I've got 1 minus p hat, I've got n. So I've got everything I need to calculate that standard deviation. I would put all that in, I would take the square root, I would have that number. So in order for us to calculate the margin of error though, we still need z sub alpha over two. How confident are we supposed to be? 95% confident is how confident we want to be in these results. And we already discovered that for 95% confidence, the z sub alpha over two was 1.96, if you remember. of it. Right there. <clears throat> so z sub alpha over 2 will be 1.96. My margin of error will be z sub alpha over 2 
times the square root of 422 over 864 times 442 over 864, and then it's all divided by 864. Now, uh, this compound fraction will simplify. It will simplify very nicely because all of these denominators are 864. Okay? This can be rearranged in the following way. So if I have, let's say I have... Um, Pleasure. Thank you. It's A over this denominator and then times B over this denominator and the whole thing's divided by this denominator. This is the type of setup that we're in. Right? This is P hat, 1 minus P hat, and N. And um, this will simplify uh, in the following way, uh, well, I'll, I'll write it like this. I'll use some uh, some notation that I hate, but is still occasionally convenient. This is about the only time. See that this is the same thing, right? It's, it's this times this divided by D. So it means this, right? And what's that, what's that thing that we can do to rephrase this in terms of multiplication? Inverse. Yeah, multiply by the reciprocal. So I could say times 1 over D. And that part under the radical is, is this now. All the d's just collect together in the bottom. The numerator is just a times b. So when I'm looking at this computation, it would simplify to be 1.96, that's my z sub alpha over 2. And then it's just times the square root of 422 times 442 over 864 cubed. So, I will handle doing this. Uh, I mean, you, you, you could go ahead and type all that in, um, but you have to be, you have to have strong calculator skills. If you make a mistake somewhere, uh, uh, the calculator won't understand what you're wanting. So the way I usually do is I'll start inside this square root. And I'll just compute my numerator. I'll say this times this equals 422 times 442 equals. I get 186,524. And then all I got to do is press divide. Because when you, when you just press divide, then it'll say, well, you mean to take whatever the previous answer was divided by this new thing, okay? 
<coughs> so, so now in my calculator it's saying answer divide by, and it's waiting for me to type in what I want to divide by, and I'll just type 864 and then cubed. So there's a little button on the calculator that lets you put an exponent, and you just say cubed. If you need any help on that Google calculator, let me know. I did it. You did it? Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> so now it's like uh, 2.89 something or another times 10 to the minus fourth. So it's a really small number. All right, it's got a, it's a decimal, a bunch of zeros, and then a 289. So I've got that number stored in my calculator as answer. And, and, and what, what is it? It is this stuff under the radical. So now I will just type square root of answer and press equals. And then I've got the square root of that fraction. I've got the, I've got the standard deviation, 0.017005. That's our standard deviation of the proportion. Now I will scale that standard deviation to be 1.96 bigger than what it is, and that will be my margin of error. So times 1.96, and we get our margin of error. And you want to do it to, so, so we haven't rounded a thing so far. Now we'll round to four decimal places, 0 0.03, Three, three. This is the margin of error I will use. Did you get that same margin of error, everyone? <coughs> huh? No? Okay, that's what I did too. The square root. Okay. <clears throat> okay. All right. Well, the answer to a confidence interval problem is the point estimate plus or minus the margin of error. Point estimate. Margin of error. So let's get a four decimal approximation to this point estimate. 422 divided by 864. And if you have this thing, there's a button, you know, it's going to give you a fraction. There's a button on it. It's right above the delete key, and the button says S, and then it's got an arrow to, to D. And if you press that, it'll switch back and forth between a fraction and a decimal number. And so my four decimal approximation to the uh, point estimate is 0 0.4884, <clears throat> which just means that 48.84% of the babies in this study were boys. So th this is our number. We're done. We, we have this. We wrote it down clear. Right. Now come back up here and get a four decimal approximation to p hat. Gotcha. Okay. okay. That four decimal approximation is just 422 divided by 864. We get, we get 0.4884. Okay. <clears throat> then my lower limit, my lower limit will be 0 0.4884 minus 
0 0.0333. And my upper limit will be 0 0.4884 plus 0 0.0333. Now those, that's, so I'll make those computations, but when I type in my answer, it just wants it to three decimal places. Got it, Jim? I did, but now I was trying to figure out what that looks like. What you mean? Like what? What is this? How to how, how to read this? This is saying now that. <clears throat> so what what is going on here? This is births in a state, right? There's some state. Conceivably, there was many more than 864 births in that state. But they took a random sample consisting of 864 births from that state. And in that random sample, you have this many boys, right? What we would like to know then is in that state, what is the true proportion of births which are boys? Of all the births. And we are now 95% confident that whatever that proportion of births that's boys is somewhere between 45.5% and 52.2%. Could be any number in there. We're 95% sure. 95% came in with the 1.96. Yeah. Because it, it's a. Because okay. it just adjusts that standard deviation. So we were not trying to figure out. The tail, the shaded tail, or the. Z sub alpha over 2? Yeah. This is Z sub alpha over 2. Right. Yeah, that's <clears throat> that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I got it now. Because this is the number that puts 2.5% area in the tail. But that's equivalent to saying it puts 95% of the area right in the middle. And that's easier for us to compute because that's the way our calculator works. All right, so our answer is this, it's, it's a pretty wide interval. I mean, I think it would have been safe to say, you could have guessed that the proportion was going to be near 50%, which is what this is telling you. Now they have a question for us. Suppose that somebody whoever, don't know who, some, someone of authority has like declared that per their research in this state 51.2% of births are boys. Is there a contradiction between our findings and their claim? There's no contradiction. Why not? Because 0.512 fits in. 0.512 is inside here. So it very well could be the case that P is 0.512. Because P could be any number in, inside of here. There is no contradiction. So, so they're asking it in, the, in terms of is there strong evidence? Yes, there is strong evidence. We're 95% sure that P is in here. And our 
interval that we've provided houses 0.512, where is the evidence? The evidence is this random sample that had this many boys in it. What did I do? Yeah, no, you have to read it very carefully. There is strong, oh, it says against. Yeah, so it's, there is not strong evidence. Not strong evidence yeah. against. Yeah, it says, it says. It's not uh, contained. Uh, yeah, it's super confusing. Strong evidence against that belief. No, there's not strong evidence. I guess so I should have stuck with my does it contradict thing. Uh, there's not strong evidence against uh, this because the 0 .512 is contained inside the confidence interval. All right, we all good? Question five. <clears throat> A genetic experiment with peas resulted in one sample of offspring that had 441 green peas, 163 yellow peas. I don't think I've ever seen a yellow pea. Yeah. So who knows what they're doing over there in their lab. Uh, what's in? 40, 6, oh, numbers. Yeah. It's the sum of the green and the yellow peas. <clears throat> then I know that p hat would be, uh, now, now what are they wanting me to do an estimate of? They wanted me to make a confidence interval to estimate the percentage of yellow peas. So having a success is getting a yellow pea. So p hat will be 163 over 604. And 1 minus p hat would be 441 over 604. And they want a 95% confidence interval. So once again, our z sub alpha over 2 will be that number 1.96. Open your normal calculator, switch it to between, and insist on getting 90% of the area between two numbers. You get 1.6449. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You can actually sit there and make a short list of of these and then not have to resort back to the calculator over and over because all the common ones are 90, 95, and 99. I don't think you're going to see anything else. That's not just something that's happening because this is a homework. That's just how it is in the business. <clears throat> But I don't have a list of them. I just have 1.96 for whatever reason. I just have it memorized. So you'll use 1.6449. Up here, I'm going to use 1.96. And then it will be times the square root of 163 times 441 over 604 cubed.
I get that my margin of error is 0 0.0354. How do I know to carry four decimals? Well, they're asking me to round to three in my answer, so I'm going to have an extra one over here always and round at the very end. The decimal approximation for my p hat, 163 over 604 is 0 0.2699. Then my lower estimate, my lower limit is 0.2699 minus the error, 0 0.0354. And my upper limit is 0 0.2699 plus 0 0.0354. All right. Based on the confidence interval, do the results of the experiment appear to contradict the expectation that 25% of the peas would be yellow? Do we have a contradiction? It's like there's some genetic scientist of peas that says it's supposed to be 25% always. Well, then does their claim contradict our confidence interval? Well, we have the lower limit and the upper limit, and it contains 25%. So no, there's no contradiction. Any questions?
all right, well, we're getting good at this. The next one is about Emily and her science fair project. It's a dumb question. It, uh, it essentially amounts to flip a coin, can someone else guess with their clairvoyance what, what did it land, heads or tails? In the problem, they're saying she's using the, if it lands heads, I'm gonna put it in my right hand. If it lands tails, I'm gonna put it in my left hand, something like that. And then she you know, holds her hands, or she, you know, she's like, you know, guess which hand I have it in. But that's the same thing as just saying, did it land heads, did it land tails? And, and they have to like, use their mental powers to figure it out. They tried it 273 times, and they were only correct 124 times. Part A. Uh, since she uses the coin toss, what proportion of correct responses would be expected if the people were just making a random guess and not using their clairvoyance? So I flip a coin, you guess at random. You could always just say heads, too. How often will you be right? 50% 50 of the time. That's what it'll look like if these people just make a random guess. They'll be right 50% of the time. Okay. What is the point estimate of these uh, psychics? Well, they were right 124 times out of 273 times. So that's only 45.4%. They did worse than a random guess. But that was just on these 273 trials. I don't actually know what their performance would be on some unlimited number of trials. This only tells me how they did on the 273 trials. But I can construct a confidence interval centered on this number that would that would, uh, to, a, to a certain degree of confidence, tell me what their true performance is, P. They want me to build a 95% a confidence interval. So here we are with 95% again. And if and, and if this interval ends up containing 0.5, then it could be plausible that, that they have a, a system that is comparable to a, a random guess. But if this interval is completely below 0.5, then they are awful. Always awful. It would tell me that, they're, that I'm 95% sure that they always perform worse than a random guess. All right, so. They were right 124 times, so they were wrong 149 times. I will take 1.96 times 120 times the square root of 124 times 149 over 273 cubed. This is my margin of error. My p hat, I already have, it's 0.454. Okay. <coughs>
0.591 is that margin of error. So my point estimate minus that margin of error. And then they have four, and they have a follow-up question, and we have to be very careful here. We are not really able to conclude anything. having to do with 0.5 except for that 0.5 is inside our interval. But that does not mean that we have evidence that they can, can you know, do it. That they can guess correctly. Just because this upper limit extended past 0.5 does not constitute evidence that they can guess which hand or guess which side it landed on. You have to have the entire confidence interval be on one side or the other of 0.5. If the whole confidence interval had been below 0.5, where both the lower limit and the upper limit were less than 0.5, then I would have evidence that they don't know what they're doing. They'd be better off with a random guess. Likewise, if I had the whole confidence interval above 0.5, that would constitute proof or a strong evidence, not proof, it would be strong evidence that they have a good system that performs, that outperforms a random guess. But with 0.5 being contained in here, it just says that their performance is on par <laughs> with a random guess. It could very well be equivalent to a random guess. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. It could very well be just a random guess. So, it cannot be question it cannot be response B because that's just talking about having one side of the confidence interval above 0.5. Question B is basically saying since 0.5 is in the interval, there appears to be evidence that they can sense the correct hand. No. All that would show us is that, that it is possible that their method is equivalent to a random guess. It can't be C because um, C, is, C and B are like equivalent statements. The only thing different is the first part. The first, and, and this, everything before the comma in both of these 
can exactly be translated to say that 0 0.5 is in the interval. And same thing here. That also just says 0 0.5 is in the interval. So it must be a we good? The rest of the questions are a little different style. So seven, eight, nine, and ten change gears from being about a proportion to being about a mean. Look at what we're estimating now, mu. And what did mu represent? Sample. No. It's a mean, but not of the sample. Population. Population mean. The Greeks are for population. So this is Greek, it's talking about the population mean. <clears throat> and, oh, we're trying to estimate the body temperature of healthy adult humans. In this problem, mu is the, is the population average body temperature for all the people, everywhere. I can't go measure everyone's temperature. All I can do is get a sample and figure out the stuff about my sample and then construct a confidence interval that will, that I'll be to within a certain degree of confidence sure that the population parameter that I'm looking for is inside this interval. So, so whatever numbers I come up with, I'll be very sure that whatever the real body temperature of healthy adult humans is, it's somewhere between these two numbers. And everything that we do is, is pretty much the same. Everything that we need to do is pretty much the same. The answer is still the point estimate plus or minus the error. The differences are that now the sample mean is the point estimate. I mean, you take a sample, you find their average, that's a great starting point for what the average should be of the whole population. So we'll build a confidence interval that has the sample mean right in the middle. We have some plus or minus a margin of error, and we'll be saying that the population mean would be within this margin of error. So X bar is our point estimate. And the margin of error this time, it's a very similar equation in that it's something like a z-score times something like a standard deviation. But this time, it's not truly a z-score, it's a t sub alpha over 2. And this standard deviation is computed as s over square root of n. Now s over square root of n is familiar to you because that's what we were doing at the end of last week, which was the first three problems on this homework. s over the square root of n is a close approximation to sigma over square root of n. Which was, this, which was the standard deviation of the sample mean. S is the sample standard deviation. N is still the, the size of the population, or size of the sample. And if you wanted to get technical with it, you could, you could go even further to see how this was reasonably the same as what we were doing because you could write it as S times s over n take a square root. 
and it would simplify to just be this. So it so it has a very very similar feeling in that it's this it's this two numbers getting multiplied divide by n take a square root but the numerator just they're both s and when you square root s squared you just get back to s so so then the only question is what is t sub alpha over 2 There is this other distribution. It's called the, I don't know why it's called this, but I don't think it's after the actual students, but it's called the student's T distribution. There must have been somebody named student somewhere. It's the student's T distribution. Okay. So when we had when we talked about the standard normal curve, there's just the one standard normal curve, and that's it. But there is an infinite number of students' t distributions. Uncountably infinite number of them. Because this student's t distribution depends on the value of n. There's a, for every different sample size, there's a different student's t distribution. <clears throat> and what happens is, um, as n goes off to infinity, the t distribution becomes normal. So if n is very, very, if your sample size is very, very, very large, then the t distribution is a very close approximation to the normal distribution. You get to it by using your T calculator. It's right there on the list next to normal. You cannot specify a different standard deviation. Okay? It's just, it is what it is, just one. But the thing that you instead specify is DF. DF is what it wants to know. It stands for degrees of freedom. DF. Now, uh, there's four of us, there's four of y'all here. Okay. Suppose that we had a paper exam that we had to take, but nobody came prepared. Everybody forgot their pencil. But I have four pencils. And I put my four pencils out here on the table. One for each of you. And uh, I say, come get them. All right. So y'all just line up randomly, right? Whoever gets here first. Is, the first person comes up, they have their choice. They have their choice. They're not identical pencils. They're all like different colors. Or something. And the first person has choice that they can make. And the second person, so the first person has four pencils to choose from, and the second person has only three pencils to choose from. And so how many pencils are there left to choose from by the time they get to the third person? Does the last person have a choice? There's no choice anymore. They have no degree of freedom. To, to make a choice. They're just going to get what they get. So, so in that story, the degrees of freedom was three. Because 
the fourth person didn't have a choice. Only the first three people did. Degrees of freedom is always just the size of the sample, and then the last one doesn't have a choice. If I go to StatCrunch and get my calculator page, get my T calculator, so I can just go to Stat Calculators T. Do something silly like put in a DF of two. Look at what you get. It's a, it looks like a hat function. But if I change that to 2000, it sure is looking normal. See what I'm saying? As N increases, then so will DF. And, and so then a very large DF corresponds to a very close approximation to normal. And we'll just have to use this T calculator to get our T sub alpha over 2. That number that's going to modify that standard deviation. So I'll switch it to between. I'll put it on between. And how confident do I want to be here? I want to be 99% confident. Now, when you're doing these with the T curve, you can't just have that short list of numbers because it would be very unlikely that you have a, the same N, right? Uh, this, so my, my N here is 105, so my DF is 104. I'll put in my 104 for my degrees of freedom and then tell it I want 99% of the area I get 2.6239. If I change that DF just by, uh, you know, a couple of numbers, I get a different T sub alpha over 2. So it's highly dependent on your degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom is n minus 1, and I want it to be 99% confident in these results. So my t sub alpha over 2 is equal to 2.6239. It comes from the degrees of freedom. It's the degrees of freedom. So I look at what my sample size is. Minus one. To correspond with that story of the pencils, how the last person didn't have a choice. Okay, now I'm done with this little calculator. Let's minimize it. They gave me S. It's 0.64. They gave me the point estimate, 98.7. And I know N. I'm ready to compute. It'll be 2.6239 times S over root N. This is my margin of error. My point estimate was 98.7. So I'm like nearly done. Right. Let's do the computation. It'd be 0 0.64 divided by the square root of 105. And okay, and then times 2.6239. 
and I get an error of 0 0.1639 degrees Fahrenheit. So my lower limit will be 98.7 minus 0 0.1639. My upper limit is 98.7 plus 0 And then they have the follow-up question, what does this, what do these results suggest about the usage of that typical number, 98.6? Well, 98.6 is contained in this interval. So it is completely plausible that the mean really is 98.6. Now, you may not have that same findings. You might have an interval that's, let's say, completely above 98.6. You might have 98.6 right here on your number line, and then you might have a, a lower limit and an upper limit that is completely above 98.6 then if this is your confidence interval, you would have to respond to that follow-up question as this suggests that the mean body temperature is higher than 98.6. Because look at where my mean would live. My mean would have to live over here above 98.6. We'd be 99% sure that that was true, if that's what our data was telling us. <clears throat> you all right? I don't see, so I'm following along with you, but I'm putting in my numbers. For this one, it's just not coming back right to me. Okay, so S and square root of N is pretty straightforward, right? Mm -hmm. So the problem more than likely is with the T sub alpha over 2. That's the first thing to check. So what is the level of confidence they have? They have 99% okay. for the confidence, and I put that in the stack line. Can you see what You have your DF set as 105, so you must have 106 people in your study, right? Yes. Okay. And you used all four digits of the, the number that you were given, right? That's probably what I messed up on. Yeah. 2.6435. 2.6435. Back to the problem. 
then it will be that number times 0 0.66. Over the square root. Okay. That's part of your problem. So, so uh, here's what you'll have. Uh, yeah. So from right here. Mm. Well, let's see what is. I don't know what that number is to start with. Yeah. So I need. Point six six. Everybody else doing good? <clears throat> Question eight, we have a clinical trial for a drug to treat insomnia. Uh, it's only got 15 people in this trial, so N is 15. And now before treatment, they had this as their average wake time, but after treatment, their wake time was, their average wake time was this, that's X bar, and then this is S. So I wanna, t I wanna study the, the treatment numbers and then I'll come back and see if this untreated version is contained in my interval. Because if my interval contains this number, the drug isn't doing anything. It, it, would, it would be completely plausible that, that the average wake time for treatment is the same as non-treatment. However, if that interval is completely underneath the 105, then you have evidence that the drug is effective. Okay, uh, and how confident do we want to be? We want to be 99% confident. My N is 15, so my DF is 14. I'll come to my T calculator. My DF will be 14, and I want 99% of the area. I get my T sub alpha over 2, 2.9768. And then it's times S over the square root of n. So it's 23.2 over square root of 15. All right, my margin of error is 17.8317 minutes. My point estimate, 75.2. I guess since they only wanted me to round to one decimal place, I could have just, just done two to just done two over here, would have been fine. Always just one more 
than what you're going to round to later on. So my lower limit will be 75.2 minus 17.83. And my upper limit will be 75.2 plus 17.83. And I don't know if you noticed yet, but since the point estimate is right in the middle and the distance over to each edge is the margin of error, once you calculate your lower limit, you can just add twice the error and you will be at the upper limit. In other, words, the, in other words, the width of the confidence interval is two times the error. You can see it. There's one of them. There's the other one. And the point estimate is right in the middle. So 75.2 minus 17.83, I get 57.37. They want me to round to one decimal, so it's 57.4. And then I'll just add two times the margin of error, 17.83, and I get Well, now I have my confidence interval, and I can visualize what's going on on a number line. There's 57.4, and there's 93, and the untreated average was 105, and we are 99% sure. That's awfully sure. We're really sure, so it's making a wide interval. We're 99% sure that with treatment, your mean wake time will be somewhere over here. But without treatment, it's over there. So this drug is effective because the interval is completely below the untreated condition. Make sense? Janet, you was working? Yeah, but now. Yeah, but no? Yeah. Yeah. I guess I just something in it. I have different numbers. Uh-huh. Um, but I don't know where I'm going wrong on that. Okay.
to one decimal place. All right, this is the way business is done in the world of statistics. It's just like this. Uh, to come up with evidence that something is working or not or whatever question you're trying to answer. The good old garlic for lowering, lowering cholesterol treatment. Does it work? Let's see. Uh, we're going to test for the effectiveness of garlic. I've got 44 subjects, and we measured before and after their LDL. And uh, that change in cholesterol, so before minus after, if it's a positive number, then that means there was a decrease because it's before minus after. Right? If your cholesterol was, you know, I don't even know what the legitimate numbers are. If it's if it's 100 and then now it's 50, well then before minus after is 50. That's a positive number, and it went and it went down. So a positive number over here. Since the, the mean is 4.8, so on the average, cholesterol went down after treatment with garlic. But look at that standard deviation. Oh, it's a whopper. So it's insufficient to just go, oh, well, the average, on the average, they, they lowered their cholesterol, so it must be effective, right? No, that's not how, that's not evidence. We have to account for that variation in the, in the sample. And that's where the standard deviation comes into effect. Now, way back in the day, you could use these T distribution tables. Of course, um, you, you don't need to because you have the T calculator. Right? Um, they're very unpleasant to try and work with. So don't mess with none of that. Um, I'm wanting to do a 95% confidence interval, and I have 44 subjects. So my DF is 43, and I'll put 95% area there. I get 2.0167. Well, then it is times um, 18.8 over the square root of 44 and that's my error. carry one more decimal than what they're wanting me to round to. So it's saying round to two, so I'll carry three. <coughs> and <coughs> my X bar, the point estimate is 4.8, so lower limit is 4.8 minus 5.716, and the upper, the upper one would be 4.8 plus 5.7. One six.
you can see already that one of these numbers is negative and one of them is positive. Well, then that means that mu could potentially be zero. Because if one of these is negative and the other one is positive, then zero is in here. And if zero is going to be inside this interval, then it's, it's completely plausible that the mean is zero. What are we measuring with that mean, the before minus after? So it stands to reason that it's not effective. If it was going to be effective, then both of these numbers need to be positive. So in the follow-up question, they ask, what does this suggest about the effectiveness? Uh, it contains zero, so it suggests that garlic did not affect cholesterol levels. Question 10, last one. Archaeologists have studied Egyptian skulls in an attempt to determine uh, breeding among different cultures. Okay. They've measured the widths of skulls from way back when. Oh, we don't need to be very confident this time, just 90%. <coughs> Uh, but I don't have a mean and standard deviation. Ideas? Is that crunch? And where do you go from there? Stat, summary stats, columns. Stat, summary stats, columns. And you can just click VAR1 and click compute because that's what that's all you're it, it already has what you're needing right on the list. You're needing X bar, which is the mean, and the standard deviation, which is S. So X bar is 133.65 and S is 6.05 uh, 1 all right and <coughs> uh, it also tells you you know in case you don't want to count <laughs> how many were there there was eight in is eight all right, there's eight skulls in that sample. So uh, now I'll need to get my T calculator. And my DF will be eight minus one. It's for between and I just want 90% of the area. So my T sub alpha over two is the very small 1.8946. I should multiply that number by 6.051 divided by the square root of 8. And that's my error.
and give 4.053. So my lower limit will be 133.65 minus 4.053. My upper limit is 133.65 plus 4.053. Oh, it's 137, not 138. And that's it.